السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We thank Allah upon all conditions We seek protection solely from the condition of those who shall be cast into hellfire We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his household, his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all and to bless every one of us and to grant us the most beneficial rain that we are greatly in need of in this beautiful city of Cape Town and in the Western Cape, in fact, in South Africa at large. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and may Allah bless all those who are struggling across the globe in whatever way they may be struggling in their difficulties, may Allah create ease for them and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them all from His mercy. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us the opportunity to gather in His house. And like I said, and I repeat, the fact that we have gathered in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It shows the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For him to have you in his house is really not something minor. It is a very, very big deal, alhamdulillah. So thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make the visit more frequent for indeed it will be within the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yesterday, I had spoken about the qualities of the worshippers of the most merciful. And I said why they were called the worshippers of the most merciful and they were not referred to as the worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mentioning very quickly, recapping before I continue. They are the worshippers of the most merciful because if they were to fulfill the qualities that were mentioned or that are mentioned in the verses, then indeed they would be earning the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah calls them the worshippers of the most merciful. Also to show us that that quality of mercy is indeed a great quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will definitely, definitely be known by and he will be definitely encompassing us with that beautiful mercy of his in the dunya and the akhirah. So we made mention of many qualities. I'm not going to go and mention each one of them, but I will start off at the point where Allah says, the true believers, when they have committed sin, whether it be murder, whether it be adultery, whether it be association of partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they repent. They turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously the issue of murder is a whole separate topic. And I, like I said yesterday, it is unacceptable and it is the duty of a Muslim to ensure that he protects other lives rather than causing injury, harm and loss of life. But when it comes to the issue of adultery, when it comes to the issue of immorality, when it comes to the issue of association of partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember the procedure of seeking the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not very difficult. It requires one to admit the sin, to regret it, to seek the forgiveness and to promise not to do it again. Four simple conditions. And if these four conditions are met, the sin is forgiven. Man taba taba Allahu alayhi. Whoever seeks Allah's forgiveness, Allah forgives him. Never ever did Allah say, whoever seeks my forgiveness, I will think about it or I will not forgive them. No way. Not once did he say that whoever seeks forgiveness, I won't forgive them. Every time he says, whoever asks Allah's forgiveness, Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. Whoever seeks forgiveness, he will be forgiven and so on. So when you seek forgiveness, you are forgiven. But there is another level that is higher than just seeking forgiveness and being forgiven. And that is to be able to get the bad deeds that were committed, converted into good deeds such that when we arrive on the day of judgment, we find them as good deeds that we have not even done. Subhanallah. So when a man arrives on the day of judgment or a woman and he sees lots of salah, he sees lots of zakah, he sees so many other deeds and he asks, I don't think I did all these deeds. 
Where did this come from? He will be told, when you did bad, then you repented. Then you believed and did good deeds only thereafter. We loved the fact that you did not go back to your evil ways so much that we converted all that evil into good and we are presenting it to you as acts of worship today. That's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, it is impossible to think of a person who is owed, say for example, a million rands. You owe someone a million rands, say $100,000 for example. Not only by you saying, please forgive me, you know what, it's, it's wrong what I did. I know I owe you the money. I'm not going to be able to pay you back. Imagine if that person were to say, don't worry, forget about it. In fact, here's another $100,000, take it, it's yours. Wow, subhanallah. I wish we could have people like that. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. We find it difficult to forgive our own brothers and sisters. Sometimes our family members, our parents, our children. We find it difficult to forgive them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. The relationship we have even with our spouse is unique. It is so unique that sometimes we find it difficult to forgive each other when we need each other the most. Remember, when a mistake happens, we want the forgiveness of Allah. When we perpetrate or commit a sin or a crime against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want His forgiveness. If we would like the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must learn to forgive others, especially those whom you are closest to. So for example, if your spouse has made a mistake, imagine they were dedicated for 10 years. After 10 years, they faulted for one year. In that one year, the marriage was broken and it's over. But you forgot about the 10 years whereby you lived in bliss. Had you been patient for that year, then definitely you may have seen the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point that beyond that turbulence, which may have lasted a year or two, you became happier than you were ever before. And you became closer than you were ever before. It's possible. I'm not condoning oppression to the degree that a person's mind begins to, meaning a person loses their mind, they become unwell. No, don't go back home and say, you know what? I troubled you now for one year. Go back and listen. I've been good with you for 10 years. It's okay. That's not good enough. No, we should not use these words in order to justify the evil we are in. These words are just an encouragement for us when we are on the other side to say, look, consider forgiving. That's what these words are. So we should never use these words to justify the position of wrong that we may be in. But rather, when we are oppressed, we should see, we should look within ourselves if we can actually forgive our spouses and others as well. And the reason I make mention of this is when you want the forgiveness of Allah, there is definitely a greater chance of earning it if you are a person who forgives others. Did you see? If you are a person who forgives others, there is a greater chance that you will be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a condition. I don't have to forgive those who have wronged me. But if I do, there is a greater chance that Allah will forgive me. And this we got from Surah An-Nur. I spoke about it when we read the verse a few days ago. But my brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amazing. He says he will convert the bad into good. Imagine that's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is for the one who quits the bad ways and habits and does good after that. This is why in the Quran, Allah doesn't say those who believe will be granted Jannah. Those who believe will be granted Jannah, will be granted paradise. He doesn't say that. He joins it. He connects it to something else. He says, Those who believe and do good deeds, they will be the ones who enter Jannah, who enter paradise. So it's always Amilu Salihat. It's connected, right? Allah says, those who believe and do good deeds, they will enter Jannatul Firdaus. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannah through His mercy. Amen. Now, after making mention of forgiveness and repentance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to make mention of the qualities that we need to save ourselves from if we want to be known as the worshippers of the most merciful. One of the qualities is 
وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورَ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا In fact, these are two qualities. Those who protect themselves from bearing false witness. You take an oath and you have lied. Sometimes in the courts, we lie. We make a false claim against someone. We lay a false accusation against someone and it's by oath. I remember the once there was a brother from the masjid who actually lied. He lied about something and he went to the courts and he presented a sworn affidavit that this had happened and it did not happen. So when I asked him, how could you have done this in the courts? He told me, you know what? I put my hand on the Bible, not on the Quran. So it is okay. <laughs> you are not supposed to be telling a lie no matter what, whether you put your hand anywhere. You're not supposed to be telling a lie. You don't have to justify by uttering such nonsense. Astaghfirullah. No matter what, that was an oath by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your word is supposed to be truthful. Even if you just had your hands down, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Look at how shaitan comes to mankind to try and make him justify the wrong he's doing by hook or crook. Subhanallah. And in Cape Town, the snook. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, we should never be telling a lie. Bearing false witness is dangerous. It is something that will come back to haunt us at some stage. And you know, sometimes we do something. We feel that, okay, this was okay. I got away with it. You have not yet got away with it. You need to repent, seek Allah's forgiveness and seek forgiveness from those whom you have wronged. Because if you don't, I promise you, the circle will close. It's going to come back to you and it will haunt you. You know, they say, Kama tadinu tudanu. How you shall do to others, so it shall be done unto you. The type of, the type of debt you have is the type of debt you shall actually get. The credit you give is, the, is what you shall get. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. You know, in the English language, the term is you, what you sow, you reap or you reap what you have sown. Same applies. Remember, it's going to come back to you. So how does it come back to us? It comes back to us through health problems, family problems, financial problems, stress, so many other things. We are suffering, lack of contentment, no sleep. We don't know what to do. We don't know what's the problem. Have you ever? born false witness against someone if the answer is yes perhaps that's come to haunt you may allah forgive us i'm not saying every time you're sick you need to think hey this is what happened but a true mu'min is such that whenever something goes wrong in his life within himself or herself he quickly ticks off the checklist you know what that means have i paid my zakat yes i have have i wronged someone no, I haven't. Have I fulfilled my obligation unto Allah? Yes, I have. Did I do this? Yes. Have I done this? No. Okay, that's where maybe that's where I went wrong. So it's a checklist. You've got to do that. It does not necessarily mean that Allah is punishing you. No, but it could mean that. You see, it could mean. So just like when you have a sickness, I have a sore throat, for example. I was wondering if I was going to be able to stand up and speak in front of you today. But Alhamdulillah, it happened by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have to ask myself, have I been having some cold drinks after taraweeh? Have I been having ice cream? Have I been eating chocolates? Whatever else, subhanAllah. But by the way, I haven't been. But I'm just saying. So if I find something wrong, I need to deal with it. I cannot keep on having medication and keep on doing that, which is going to cause a bigger problem and not resolve it. Same applies in our lives. Spiritually, we want to get close to Allah. We keep on doing some sin that we have not quit. How do we want goodness in our lives when we haven't stopped that? You are having an antibiotic known as Tawbah. You, you perhaps are having medication known as your Salah and the Quran and so on and the good deeds, but you keep on committing that particular sin that is keeping you bogged down and sick spiritually. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. I hope we've understood that. So therefore, we need to quit these type of things because they come back to haunt us. So much so that Allah says, not only bearing false witness. You know, bearing false witness is so serious. When the Prophet ﷺ counted the major sins, he was lying on his bed. And he was counting al-ishraq billah, uququl walidain, etc. Then he got up. Kana muttaki'an fajalasa. He was laying down, he sat up. 
He says, Allah wa qawlu zuri wa shahadatu zur. He says, Behold, to utter that which is false and to bear false witness is a major sin. It's not a minor sin, it's major. You see, there are minor sins that people may commit. Sometimes you haven't controlled your gaze. Sometimes, you know, there may be a slip of the tongue here and there, minor sins. But major sins, those which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned a severe punishment regarding the major sins. Bearing false witness is one of them. My brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Especially if the right of a fellow Muslim is connected to that witness that is false, then there is trouble. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, it is a piece of the fire. Either you take it or you leave it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to be truthful, to be steadfast. Did you know that when we are buying and selling commodities, one of the major sins actually is to lie about your cost price. Did you ever know that? To swear with an oath using the name of Allah that you got it at the price and you did not get it at the price. The hadith says three types of people. Allah will not even look at them on the day of judgment and Allah will not even purify them. And subhanallah, they have a severe punishment. That's what the hadith says. لا يكلمهم الله ولا ينظر إليهم يوم القيامة ولا يزكيهم ولهم عذاب أليم. Three types of people. Who are they? One of them is the one who sells a commodity. المنفق سلعته بالحليف الكاذب. The one who sells his commodity with a false oath. Subhanallah. False oath. He lied. So if you want to buy something and someone says, how much is this? You say, look, it's a hundred dollars. No, please give me a discount. Say, look, I can't give it to you because I bought it at 90. I can't give it to you for less than a hundred. Why lie that you bought it at a 90? Tell him, look, that's the best price I can manage. That's it. Tell him, look, you know what? It's going to be difficult for me to go beyond that or below that. Be honest. But to lie, to say, no, I got it at this amount. That is something serious. Now, you might wonder, why is it so serious? Because Allah decided it's serious. That's why. I can't say anything else. For us, sometimes things become light. So what? The guy, you know, I just had to tell him. I had to get him off my back. Well, you, I don't know how you get the sin off your back thereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So, it is important for us to know this. You might want to know who the other two are, right? So that was one. I can see some of the eyes, like you're asking a question. One is Al-Mannan. Mannan meaning, Mannan in this hadith means a person who brags about what he's done. He gave you something and he keeps on mentioning, you know, I gave you this. You know, I gave you this. You know, he gave me $10 when I was a kid. You know, when you were a kid, I gave you 10 bucks. Do you remember? Brother, I'm, oh, come, I'll give you a hundred. Come, come, come here. I'll give you a hundred back and stop talking about it. That's how, that's what we feel like doing sometimes. When you do someone a favor, don't brag. Don't embarrass him thereafter. Don't keep on reminding. Otherwise, Allah says, we're not interested in looking at you on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So, a person who wants to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should do things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is something very, very interesting. Let's move on. My beloved brothers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this false witness. Not only bearing false witness, my brothers and sisters, but telling a lie, any sort of a lie, is something that will earn the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We definitely need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness and we need to become more conscious of the statements that we are uttering because we will never be able to save ourselves if we are not conscious of what we say. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has spoken about this on so many occasions. In this verse, Allah says, وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا the worshippers of the most merciful, when they are passing by those who are wasting their time, that which is futile, when they are passing by that which is futile, you know, people are wasting their time, sitting and doing something unnecessary, just a waste of time. The true believers, they use their time so wisely that they just pass by. When they see these guys are wasting time, they don't waste time with them, they pass by. So you value your time. Valuing your time is a sign of closeness to Allah because Allah created time and guess what? It is ticking. So don't waste a moment. And this is why the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ni'matan, 
مغبون فيهما كثير من الناس الصحة والفراغ two gifts many people are deceived regarding number one is good health people take it for granted they are deceived regarding good health they waste it number two free time your time you just waste it you let it go by you had the whole holidays you didn't do anything in the holidays nothing constructive you didn't even mow the lawn may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us may Allah guide us so do something constructive with your time no matter what it is I've given you a simple worldly example but that example can become spiritual and it can become religious. Read the Quran, take some lessons, do something. You need to know every moment you've been given here is a chance for you to reap the fruit in the hereafter. So use the time to sow wisely. So this is why the, the Quran says in these verses that a true believer of the most merciful, when he passes by that which is futile, he, he, he actually passes by without stopping there, without wasting his time. Then there is a quality that is very, very important. And that quality is those who love Allah, those who are close to Allah, those who want to save themselves from harm, whenever they are reminded about the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they take heed. They do not turn a deaf ear or a blind eye. In the English language, we say turning a blind eye. In the Arabic language, they add to it the deaf ear. Because two, two of these faculties, one is the eye and the second is the ear. So those who turn a blind eye or who give a deaf ear or who do not want to listen, in other words. Those whom when they are reminded of the verses of Allah, they don't turn away from it. Neither with their ears nor with their eyes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So why is this verse being made mention of here? How will you know that you're doing wrong when no one is there to tell you that you're doing wrong? You know, when we lead Salat al-Taraweeh, one of the biggest gifts that the Imam can have, and my colleagues can correct me, one of the biggest gifts that the Imam leading the Salah of Taraweeh can have is a solid half is behind him to correct him because the embarrassment of not knowing where you're going now and you're stuck and you don't know what to say where to go that is so bad the feeling is really something I cannot describe the best thing would be for someone behind you to just tell you where you're going subhanallah and so you can correct yourself now if you feel bad about it and you turn back and say hey guys stop embarrassing me then you will never learn you will never learn subhanallah in order to progress you must be happy when someone corrects you yes we also call on those who are correcting others for anything in life to use the best method of correction the prophetic method of correction. You have a child making a mistake. You have adults who make mistakes. You have a community that needs guidance sometimes. You choose a blessed way. You choose the prophetic way of speaking to them. You don't just come up and speak to them in such a harsh way because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if you were harsh and hard-hearted, nobody would listen to you. If you were hard hearted and if you were harsh, they would have dispersed from around you. They wouldn't have listened to you. But it's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that made you lenient. So leniency is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's be lenient on those we correct because that is definitely a prophetic quality. And so as much as we are saying when we correct people, we should do it in the proper way. I cannot control all those who are going to correct me. Some of them might be younger than me. Some of them might be hard. Some of them might be harsh. I need to listen to what they are saying. If they are right, I should take it no matter who they are. Subhanallah. So this is the quality of a true believer in the, in the most merciful. The one who's a worshiper in, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He loves it when he's corrected. When you're corrected, you don't get angry and upset. You are happy. 
I hope the children are listening to this. But more importantly, even the adults, because sometimes we get so upset when we are corrected, when we've known something for years on end, and a little daughter or a son comes up and says, Dad, you know what? That's totally wrong. And you roll up your sleeves. May Allah never, never let that be us. I mean, so my beloved brothers and sisters, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that we should never feel bad when we are corrected. Then the last quality that is made mention of here in these verses that are the end of Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who are concerned about their offspring to the degree that they make a dua to Allah regularly, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Those who constantly say, call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say, رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ O our Rabb, grant us from our spouses, our family members, those who will be the coolness of our eyes. In other words, O oh Allah, make our families the coolness of our eyes. Make us such that when we see our family members, our eyes are cooled. We feel calm. We feel content. You look at your children, you are so happy and excited. You look at your spouse, you are so, so filled with joy. That is a dua that you have to make. Remember, this thing comes about with an effort and a dua. Sincerity is required. Some people think, okay, I'm going to try hard. And you try very hard, but you remove from the equation dua or supplication. You cannot do it on your own. My brothers and sisters, you cannot manage on your own. You need Allah's help. So therefore, ask Allah to help you. Oh Allah, grant me a family that when I look at them and when they look at me, there is the mutual coolness of our eyes. I mean, subhanallah, what a beautiful dua. Now, why is this the end of all these qualities? Many reasons. I give you one simple one. We heard about how we should be walking, how we should be talking, the ibadah, how we should be abstaining from sin, how we should not bear false witness, and so many other things, how we should spend and so on. Now we are making dua that we can pass on the baton and the, the candle can now be passed on to the next generation. So, oh Allah, myself being a worshipper of the most merciful, bestow me with all these qualities and ensure that my offspring those to come after me are blessed subhanallah blessed in what way in the same way we also want them to worship allah we also want them to have good character good conduct and from this we learn that those who lead by example are the most successful you need to remember this when you're a father and you're a role model in the home then your children will follow that example by the will of Allah. You are trying, you made a dua to Allah. You may have sometimes a little bit of turbulence because of the outside environment. But trust me, if the relationship is powerful and good, then the chances of success are far greater by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't forget to read your salah on time. Remember, لا تجعلوا بيوتكم قبورا. That's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Do not make your houses into graves. Now one might think, well, I didn't bury anyone in my house. So why does he say, do not make your house into a grave? Well, he explains that those who do not fulfill salah in the home, that home is a grave. It's a grave. Those who do not engage in ibadah in the home, it's a grave. Many of us, there's no Quran in the house. There's no salah in the house. There's no adhan in the house. There's nothing Islamic in the home. And that home is a grave. So when the children come and go, it's more like a restaurant bed and breakfast. They come in, they eat, they sleep, they get up, they gone out, they come back and that's it. And they watch TV by the way. And they sit on their phones because there's free Wi-Fi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May Allah grant us ease. If that's the home, we've lost the plot. Where is the ibadah? Where is the salah? Do you read salah together? Do you fulfill your prayer together? If that is the case, you have life in the home. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the dua that you make. You need to ensure that your house is livened. And at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caps the verses by saying, we have prepared a special place in Jannah for these worshippers of the most merciful. 
أولئك يجزون الغرفة بما صبروا ويلقون فيها تحية وسلاما Those are the ones whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they will be granted as a reward a special place in Jannah known as Al-Ghurfa a special chamber in paradise special rank in Jannah to Firdaus because of all these beautiful qualities when they sinned they repented and they did not go back to their bad ways Allah says we acknowledge all of that we are going to give them a special abode in Jannah because of their sabr because of their patience and from this we learn that it is with patience and endurance that we will earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is stopping a person from sinning and doing whatever they wish it's only the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we believe in Allah we believe there is a day to come when we will answer for all our questions and all our actions and that is the reason why we have stopped doing that which is bad there was nothing else stopping us Allah says, if that is the case, then you definitely deserve that place in Jannatul Firdaus because of your endurance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdulillah.